now that we have created some of the assets and a couple of the animations that we need in our presentation, let's go back and check in our flowchart what step are we on. So we created the navigation of the buttons coming in and we have the hovering state animation as well. When we roll over, that's a button. When I roll over, I should have that interaction happening. Now what's going to happen is it's going to ask me, okay, have you clicked on the button? What happens when I click on the button? Well, if I click on button one, which is the workflow that we're creating right now, something happens. So if I click button one, then go to and uh, go to and stop into a frame. So it's basically sending me to go and stop in a frame. So it's sending me to a frame and the name of the frame is Mark one. Then in Mark one, there's some type of animation. This is basically this. If I click, if I roll over this and if I click on the button, it takes me here. That animation, it's all happening inside a movie clip. And that movie clip, it's inside a frame called Mark 1. So the animation will probably be called Mark 1. The frame will be called Mark 1. And then inside that movie clip, I will create the animation that you just saw, which is um, when I basically an image comes in and then this box pulls out from behind that person. Now I can see that there's a bit of animation going it, it, it sort, of, sort of overshoots and comes back which is yet another principle of animation applied to user interfaces or to interactivity and this is just to create fluidity within your interfaces so if I click on that you'll notice that the background goes out and sort of bounces right back in so I need to create that animation and I also have a, a, a close button that closes my uh, movie clip or my animation and sends me back to the navigational area of my uh, presentation. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I probably want to do is I want to create this animation somewhere. That somewhere, according to my um, flowchart, would be a button called Mark 1. So I need to define where that button is, where that, where that frame is going to go. So let's go back to my, to my actual presentation here. And let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to create a new layer. And this new layer is going to be called Marquise just or marquee just to know where the different uh, animations are going to go and I'm going to send I'm going to create an empty keyframe for this at frame 40 so first and foremost I'm going to stretch all of my frames to be all the way to, to frame 40 so I'll select frame 40 and press F5 so that way my animations and everything and my button and all that stuff stays here as well I don't have to but I want it for now then what I want is I want to create an empty keyframe here in this point where I'm going to be creating that animation that you saw a second ago once I click on the button, that animation. So I'm going to create an empty keyframe here, blank keyframe. That keyframe that I've added here, the blank keyframe that will appear in that point will have a name of its own. I can apply a name label to it. So if I want to, let's say for example, apply that empty keyframe here, uh, I can go ahead and name that frame specifically, and I want to do that. The reason why I don't want to rely on the on the on the numbers for the frames is because if I by any chance don't decide that this is moving too fast or too slow, or I need to add extra frames or whatnot, that will basically push all my frames up or downstream on my timeline. So I would have to go back to the code each time and recode the numbers into my code to say, okay, I need you now, instead of going to frame 40, I need you now to go to frame 30 or whatnot. So that is time consuming. And if you have a full blown presentation, it becomes almost impossible to debug. So what you want is you want to have points of reference that are generic, in this case, a name that it doesn't matter where I move it, it will always be called that specific name. So if I name that label, I'm going to name it uh, Mark one, and I'm probably going to say Mark one frame just to differentiate it from my Mark 1 uh, movie clip, which is, which is what we're about to create. So I'll hit return, and you'll notice that my frame now has a little red flag in it. And if I stretch that just to show you, let me stretch that, it has a label attached to it. So that is the Mark 1 frame. That is the name of that frame from now on. So let me undo that to remove those frames that I just added. And in this frame, I will be creating the animation that you saw um, that the, the little thing popping up with the text behind it. So to do that, I want to go ahead and, and bring in the image that belongs to that specific animation, which is this one. And I am going to place it in that frame. And this will be the beginning of my actual um, 
of my of my actual movie clip. So this is just an image. I'm going to select that image and I'm going to turn it into a movie clip clip by pressing F8. Now in this case because that contains embedded animation, I want to make sure that I I make it a movie clip. Remember, buttons do not play any animations. Graphics, if I want an animation to play on a graphic, the frames from the graphic need to match those of my scene one of the top level um, timeline. So if my animation inside my graphic is 20 frames, my I have to give it 20 frames of time available here on my scene one in order for them to play. But if I want the movie, if I want my animation to play, even if it occupies one frame, then movie clip is the one to go. Embedded animations inside movie clips will play no matter what, unless you physically tell them via code not to play meaning you put a stop action to the movie clip. If you don't put a stop action, the movie clip will play no matter what. So you want to make sure that if you want to have animations play through and through, no matter if they're in one frame or 200 frames, you want to have a movie clip. If you want to have a graphic, then they need to match the frames in your graphic, need to match the, the in your graphic timeline, need to match the frames in your main timeline or vice versa. So movie clip is the one to go. I want to use my registration point as the center for now. That works. And I want to change the name of this movie to Mark 1. That's going to be the name of this movie clip. Let me click OK. And you'll notice that it turned into a movie clip. And it's an instance of Mark 1 on the stage. At this point, I want to rename that movie as well here under its instance name so that I can control it through code. Anything that I want to have visible to the code needs to have a variable name. So in this case, this is going to be Mark 1, and I'll hit enter or return so that it takes. There it is. And that is the movie clip that I'm going to be working on. So now to modify that movie clip, I'm going to double click in it so that I can get into it and start working around in this area. So that's my image. So I'm going to name that, ima that, that layer image. That image doesn't do anything other than hold that image, that bitmap. So I don't need to do anything on it. For the animation, I want to create a box that sort of sticks out from behind the image and showcases this area here as the uh, text area. So I'm going to create a new layer and this layer I am going to call, um, how about text area? I'm going to call it text area and that's where the text is going to go. And for that, I'm going to create, select that empty frame that just came with that particular layer and I'm going to create me a background. Now the background could be anything from a rectangle to a primitive to an object. So it doesn't have to be um, anything specific uh, or you could actually bring artwork from somewhere else if you want to. So in this case, I'm just simply going to choose a primitive rectangle and I'm going to draw the rectangle here. Now I want to change the color of this from, from the fill. I'm going to change it to white and I don't want a stroke in it. That's another thing. And I want to make sure that my options for rounding the corner are 12 which is my default. So I have that so that I can create, I can give it a little bit of a smooth uh, edge so that it doesn't look as, sh as sharp as rectangles do. So I want that to be there. And this is going to be my, uh, what I'm going to animate in that time, in the timeline right now. This is going to be coming in like this. It's going to slide in and bounce right back out to that point where it's at right now. That's going to be the movie clip that's going to contain the the text. So with that in mind, if I select it and I turn this one will not have animation inside it. So this one I can turn into a graphic. I don't need to turn this into a movie clip, although I could, but uh, it doesn't have any animation inside it. So I can turn it into a graphic. So I'll select that and I'll go modify convert to symbol and I can choose either movie clip or graphic. I'm going to call it text area, text area one because that is for the movie one, for the marquee one. So text area one, and I'm going to change it into a graphic. Let me click OK on that, and that becomes a movie clip. I mean a graphic, sorry, and an instance of that state is on the stage. I can animate this at this, in this timeline at this level, but if I double click inside it, the whatever animation I create here won't play back unless I give it enough frames in the previous movie clip and enough, enough frames in the scene one. So that's why we don't use graphics for embedded animation. However, I double clicked in that text area because I want to put the text in here and I want to put that uh, by me now um, button down here. So to do so, I'm going to rename the layer. This one's going to be the background. And then I'm going to put in another layer and this is going to be the text. 
and another one that's going to be my buy button if I wanted to have the buy button in there now to create the text all you need to do is just go to your text tool and either click and drag to create a text area like so or click now clicking will automatically create static text and that's what we want to do for this presentation differences between static text dynamic text and input text are that static text is basically just text that you put into your presentation and that's it it just it's treated as a piece of text as if it were an HTML document dynamic text is text that you can modify from the outside so you can feed um, information or new text into a text field that's basically what dynamic text does input text is exactly what it says is basically if you want to create a form you have an input box and that's what input text is now static text can be just simply static text or you can actually embed whatever font you're working on onto the text when you create the text so in this case this is going to be a title sorry let me go ahead and do that again let's click over here and i'm going to type my product that's going to be my title and with that selected let me actually select the entirety of the text and i can go ahead and change my font my size all of the things that we find under uh, word processing programs you will find in here um, let's go ahead and you can also, also change the color which is something we want to do right now let me go ahead for a dark charcoal gray let me place this here and what i want to do at this point is one of two things if I'm using a generic font like I am right now, Arial, then I don't have to worry about this because every computer in the world has Arial installed. But if I'm using a font that is specific to my brand or a font that I know won't be available on a, on a web server somewhere, uh, something that is not available on the, on, if you're not connected to the Adobe um, font server or uh, a Google uh, font server, then you need to make sure that if, and you want your font to retain the look and feel of it, then what you want to do is you want to break it apart. You want to make this instead of text, you want to turn it into fills. The problem with that is that when you turn it into fills, your program, Here's the top Google your, result. your program will not, um, your program will not recognize the font as a font anymore. It will recognize it as a, as a piece of art. So as a fill or as a, um, as a shape basically when you break it apart. So right now it is text. If I double click it, I have access to it. But when I do what I'm about to do, which is break it apart, I go modify, break apart. Every character became its own box of text. And if I break it apart again, now they became fills. So if I deselect and then I go click on any of these things, I can modify the shape of the text because they are actual fills. They're not fonts anymore. So I cannot double click and edit so make sure that if you're going to do this you do it at the very end so that the font uh, will basically remain as you want it however if you want it to retain the ability to be to be a font then what you want to do is you create the text box add the font and once you're done with that there is an embed tool let me undo this a couple of times so you guys can see it uh, i went back to this being a text box and when i select it you will notice that i have an embed tool here so if I want to embed the tech, the, the actual font of my, in my presentation, I will click embed and then it will give me the option to choose what do I want to embed, whether I want the capital letters, lowercase letters, numbers, special characters or everything. So you have the ability to embed the font into your presentation and that way when this plays back, the font reference will be inside the actual file. So <clears throat> it's something that the product allows you to do that is extremely helpful especially if you're creating standalone presentations. Now inside this, I also want to uh, create that, bring in that button, the buy me button movie clip, and I'll just go ahead and drag that here. Let me double click on that so you guys can see what that is. This is basically just a text, uh, I mean the rectangle and a text box. There's nothing fantastic about that. So nothing to write home about. Uh, I just didn't want to recreate it because it's time consuming, but it's basically fairly easy. That also tells you that you can reuse a lot of the things that you create, artwork that you create for projects, you can keep on reusing it across many other projects. So with that done, let me go back to Mark 1, to the movie where this resides, and that's where this animation is going to take place. So to create that animation, I want to say I want this to take about a second of time, so I'll expand my timeline to one to half a second, sorry. 
and I, I forgot I was working at 60 FPS. So now I want that to be where my product lands, where that particular uh, uh, text area lands. So I want to activate animation there. So let me go motion tween. And I want this to start at the beginning. I want to start around here. Then I want to go to frame 30 and bring it here. Now at some point this is going to bounce back. You'll notice that my animation is linear. So I want to make sure that this basically if this my, my end point is going to be say around here. So I want that to overextend. I want to exaggerate that motion by pushing that out further past that point. So you basically see that this is bouncing, but it's a very linear bounce. I want this to go uh, basically super fast, slow down and increase in speed as it lands over here slightly. So uh, perhaps I want more frames in between those two. So I want to move this back to frame 25, let's say. So I want that to be a little bit, give me a little bit more space. So now I need to now start working on my ECs in, ECs out. The problem is that I now have three frames to take care of. So how does that work in a case like this? Well, let me double click the layer to open up its graph in editor and let me click on this little fit to view swatch to actually extend it. What I want to do is I want to make sure that this goes fast at the beginning, slows down as it gets to that frame and then slowly takes off again and it stops suddenly when it gets to where it's supposed to go. So to do that, I can at ease if I wanted to start working with these things or in, my, in this case, I want to make use of this specific tool, this little uh, button here that says add anchor on point, uh, an anchor point to graph. Now that is going to add an extra frame to your, to your animation, but that's okay because it's, it's going to allow you to create when you click and drag to create a, uh, a curve that controls the speed of, of, uh, of animation between frames, <clears throat> giving you a lot more control over how fast that animation is taking place between those two frames. It also makes the other points a little bit more elastic. So you can go ahead and say, okay, I want that here and I want that there. And perhaps I want to move this last keyframe back down a little bit more. So let me go to my stage, move it slightly more so that I get more of a curvature here. And I can now go in and hone in and control that by moving the actual uh, Bezier handle on this. So this gives me quite a lot of flexibility. Let's take a look and see what this does to my animation. So let's play this back. That's a little bit better, slows down and boom, there it goes like that. I like that. So it almost like it locks in place, but I notice that it's taking quite a long time for this to happen. I want that to happen in a less in, in a shorter amount of time. So remember, this button here adds anchors to your curve, giving you more control over how the EC in and EC out between frames occurs. Let me go ahead and double click on the layer to close it. And what I want to do now is I want to make this play a little faster, so less time. To do so, I'll select the entire layer to make sure that I have all the frames highlighted. And you don't have to actually do that. All you have to do is just go to the end of your of your animated layer. You'll notice that when I roll over the last frame, I get that little yellow line and the two arrows. That tells me that I can click and drag either to extend or contract my animation. So I'm going to make this about 24 frames. And then I'm going to bring in this guy as well. But in this case, I'm going to select those frames. I'm going to place my frame here on the, on the image layer. And I'm going to press Shift F5 on the keyboard until that point comes back to this to where I need it to be. Now let's go ahead and play that back and that's a little bit better. The speed of, I like the speed on that a little bit better. Now uh, let's go ahead and reorganize my layers but before I do that I want to create a mask to cover just where the I want the live area to be. So I want a mask covering this area here, here and here so that I see only that area of my uh, text box. And, and that's going to cover my text area. So to do so, I'll go ahead and use my uh, rectangle tool. And I'm going to create me a new layer. I'm going to call it mask. And in that layer, I want to create just a shape rectangle, nothing special on it. That's the shape rectangle that covers that area. And that all I need from this literally is just the alpha information. So if I click on it to select it and I just right click on it and turn it into a mask, you'll notice that these two things 
these two layers, the, both layers got locked. And as long as they're locked, then I can see my mask in action. So basically, I masked in this text box animation and I masked out everything else. Now I can organize my layers by bringing in the image on top of everything else and I see the animation taking place the way it's supposed to. That's one. Second, I also need to add the close button in this area and, and that then name it accordingly so that I can start activating everything that I want to do in this animation. So that's a simple one. I'll create a new layer, call it close button. And I'm going to bring in that graphic at the very end. So I'm going to create an empty keyframe at the end of that layer, F7 to add an empty keyframe. I'm going to go to the marquee to the previous uh, movies library, and I'm going to use the close button that I have there. There, it, the close button, there it is. So that's just the button with a close uh, graphic in it. So I'm just going to place that there. And the one thing I want to do at this point is give it a name. I want to call it close button one. And you'll notice that close button one, or I can call it close button actually, just close button in this case. Now, the close button one is a child of the Mark One movie. And what, what that means is it lives inside the Mark One movie. So if I want to make any reference to that button by name, I need to make sure that I mention its parent. So if, I, if I'm going to say, it's just like in HTML, uh, when you're coding um, HTML, you uh, need to have a separation of the different areas of your website. So if you have an images folder and inside that image you have an image called closebutton.jpg, if you want to reference it, then you would have the name of your website forward slash images forward slash closebutton.jpg. So that slash in HTML is the same as dot syntax in uh, coding. And dot syntax is what we use every time we call, for example, a property for a movie. So if we say, uh, I want to reference the X value of a movie clip, then I'll say movie clip dot X equals something. I am assigning a value to that X property of, my, of that movie clip. Uh, or if I'm changing the alpha, movie clip dot alpha equals something. So um, you have uh, the, the dot replaces the slash basically in, in, um, in scripting. And this works well uh, because it follows from that point on basically the same format as you will see when we start coding. So uh, we will be going back to, in, in the next movie, we'll go back and actually start coding all these things to make them, to make them interactive.